Dr. Topley, thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Vox. How are you? I'm okay. It's, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, ple- I'm very uh, honored to have you here, and I'm a little excited about tonight's show, I have to admit. I'd, well, I'd like to all, talk... That, that we have to clear, clear the Hegelian baggage uh, and lumber out of the way. Um, I, I think people should, should recall that Hegel... Uh, was really a, a very reactionary guy. He was, uh, by all odds, somebody who worked together very closely with Prince Metternich of Austria, who was the the centerpiece of these restored uh, monarchies and reactionary regimes in Austria, the Austrian Empire in Prussia, and in, in Russia, right? The so-called Holy Alliance. And Hegel... Is pretty much somebody who who represents the the holy alliance in in philosophy, except that we've got this tremendous soft spot for Rousseau. So um, I really don't think that very many people in the U.S. ruling class have ever uh, learned anything about Hegel. But uh, certainly, well, I don't think they have to. I mean, it's it's clear that now. Uh, it, whether or not they consciously are adhering to this Hegelian di- dialectic, actually, he- Hegel never actually uttered the 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 phrase uh, thesis, uh, antithesis, synthesis. Right. Yeah, he actually, actually never actually never said that. We've put that into his mouth, actually. But uh, I think that they it's feel pretty clear to the ruling class that you can't just get what you want. You have to do. You have to go through some steps first. So you got to jump through some hoops or make us jump through the hoops. What do you say? Well, of course, the, the ruling class periodically reverses its field. I mean, you go from neocon domination with Bush and Cheney, and that means direct attack and, uh, and, and, and bombing and invasion. And then when, you, when that exhausts you, right, you, you become bankrupt and isolated. Then, okay, we've got a few uh, seconds. We've got, we got a few seconds. We're going to cut to a break. I'll, we'll pick that up at the okay. top of the next. Okay. Okay. Back to the show. Uh, So I'd like to go with our guest, Dr. Tarpley, and uh, we can talk a little bit about the fiscal cliff that's facing us all, and uh, we can talk for 10, 15 minutes on that. I'd like to get to uh, Syria and talk about the soft insurgencies that are going on throughout the world today, because I know our guest, Dr. Tarpley, is one of the leading experts on how that works, and he's going to... tell you a lot about that. But let's talk a little bit about the fiscal cliff. Talk to us a little bit about that, yeah. Dr. Topley. Let's, first of all, we, we push aside Hegel, uh, who gets us nowhere. And I think for the fiscal cliff, we can go back to uh, one of Plato's dialogues, that is the Gorgias. And that's uh, the Gorgias is the study of sophism, uh, the sophists, right, who are essentially the uh, the pastry of ancient uh, Athens was this... Uh, this group of the, the sophists. So in, in, in this uh, dialogue, we have Socrates meeting Gorgias, and Gorgias is somebody who essentially dishes up rhetoric and slogans that, that, uh, that you know, powerful circles can use. Now, the relevant point is, this fiscal cliff is a fraud from beginning to end, and this term, I am sure, was developed by somebody like Frank Lunds, right? If you look at Gorgias in the old Plato dialogue, and you look at this word monger, perception monger, Frank Lunds, right? The reactionary uh, focus group guy who, you know, he says, don't call it capitalism, call it free enterprise, and he's got all this other advice. The term fiscal cliff is designed to stampede people. It's designed to frighten them, and it's uh, the, the person who introduced it. I don't think he developed it, but he introduced it. That is, of course, helicopter Ben Bernanke, the head of the Federal Reserve, who began talking about the fiscal cliff almost a year ago. And the, the goal of this is to use a, a, a largely artificial emergency, which has been artificially created, to be sure, and to try to use that to extract concessions in the direction of genocidal austerity, killer cuts, against the American people in the, in the federal budget, which is what this ruling elite wants. The problem with the ruling elite is that they've been screaming about deficits and debt. And here, of course, is a package that will indeed uh, go far towards 
you know, having some impact on deficits and debt, at least in the very short run. But this is not what they really want. They want uh, austerity that shifts the cost of the depression off the backs of the financiers and zombie bankers and hedge fund hyenas who have created this situation and put it onto the, the average working people. So let's just reject the fiscal cliff. I would say the following right now. The situation is this. You have within the Republican Party about 40 to 50 members of the House of Representatives especially. These are right-wing reactionary extremists. In most countries of the world, they would be immediately identified as fascists. And I think we might as well do that uh, here, too. And their guiding principle, they have a shibboleth, which they intend to, uh, to maintain, and it is that the, the privileges of the ruling elite are inviolable, that not one penny of tax revenue can come from the rich and the super-rich, and they have to cloak this with a, with a general opposition to, uh, to tax rates. But essentially what they're saying is we're the elite and we don't pay. Now, interestingly enough, Wall Street, generally speaking, is the cause of any fiscal shortfalls. It's that Wall Street as an institution and Wall Street as the, as the creators of this derivatives depression that we're in, and had been in since 2007, uh, you look at the main Wall Street zombie banks, and I've written an, an, uh, an article about this, which people can see at Topley.net. You look at Bank of America, Citibank, uh, General Electric, which is a hedge fund, right? It's not, a, not an industrial corporation anymore. You look at Wells Fargo. <laughs> you look at Goldman Sachs. And what you see is that they pay virtually nothing in federal corporate income tax. Now, this is, this is one that seems to have gotten completely lost, right? We're only talking about federal income tax on individuals in, in this fiscal cliff hysteria. But we ought to think about this other form of taxation, right? The tax on corporations. Uh, there's a federal corporate income tax on corporate profits, which is supposed to be 35%. But, surprise, surprise, these zombie banks, in addition to getting subsidies from the top, the Treasury, and 0% credit from the Federal Reserve, they also pay no taxes, or 1% or 2%. One year, General Electric paid minus 43%. In other words, they got back more from the federal government. So this is a huge area uh, to eliminate the loopholes in the corporate income tax. But, of course, that is a very difficult process. So the, the direct uh, solution is the Wall Street sales tax. And the difference is this. Uh, once you're talking about profit, corporations will find tax shelters. They'll find dip, dips, dodges, deals, scams, tax evasion, uh, embezzlement, you know, the LIBOR uh, complex, this entire thing. But what really cannot be hidden are transactions on, you know, futures, options, indices. Those have to go over exchanges, right, largely the ones in, in Chicago, the futures and options exchanges in Chicago. So all of that pays no tax. The average person pays, depending on your state, from 6% or 7% up to, in California, it's now reached 12%. In some states, like the benighted Virginia and other southern states, you have to pay that on groceries, which is a huge bite into the budget of the poor. Whereas Wall Street can do flash trading, program trading, a million trades per second, they pay absolutely nothing. So this amounts to favorable, favorable ta tax treatment. It means that there's a subsidy for speculation, or in reverse, you can say that productive activity, right, tangible physical production of a farmer or a manufacturer or a construction company or a mine or a scientific laboratory, that is punished because there you have to pay this sales tax. So. The, the entire um, idiocy and hollowness of this entire hysterical uh, performance, this propaganda campaign, it, it has to avoid the fact Wall Street pays no tax, and the answer is the Wall Street <laughs> sales tax. Uh, well, is there, they, is there is there any get, political will out there to make this happen? I mean, is there you know, any there momentum is, in that direction? It, 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 you know, if, if a lot of people who are, are essentially... 
you know, demoralized and disoriented and don't know what to do, would get active. We could, you could at least get this idea into circulation. And once this idea reaches critical mass, it can move very fast because most people do not understand what I've just said. They That's do not the point. understand That's the that point. Wall Street pays, pays no tax. Once they find out that Wall Street pays no tax, they become extremely angry and they don't want to entertain any notion of sacrifices for them. No, not for us. Not, not no, our we... pensions, not our health care, but rather that these Wall Street parasites should be forced to cough up. So the, the one thing that I wanted to mention is, whereas the futures options indices and other combinations go across public exchanges, they cannot be hidden. Somebody would say, well, there are over-the-counter derivatives, which are you know private counterparty agreements, right, which are just can be signed in, in, uh, in, in, in secrecy. Fine. You have a law that says if you didn't register your off over the counter derivative and this is what six hundred trillion to one quadrillion a year of that at least um, then then uh, if you didn't register it and pay the one percent tax then it can't be held up in court so that means that well, whoever's the, on the one of the problems side one of the problems the problems I see is that as soon as you start talking about derivatives credit default swaps and, and stuff like people's eyes glaze to the back of their heads and they, well, they, they don't they don't know what these words up. mean they don't they know what the word up. austerity means actually most most people actually fine that's so you have to find a sexy suicide. way to package it otherwise you're not going to get any traction with words that people just don't understand I, that's why we say killer cuts these are killer cuts this is genocide this is killing people uh, so it's a, what we need is a one percent Wall Street sales tax, and here what we've taken that lesson to heart. Some people call this a Tobin tax. Nobody knows what that is. Yeah, that's Some people ridiculous, call it a Tobin. Robin Hood tax. That's a terrible <laughs> choice, right? Robbing from the rich. Oh my God! How about that's you're awful. getting the shaft tax? I mean, you know, or prevent us. I mean, is there's got to be some some way to really get it out there because right now I don't see any traction on this issue, and I don't see any Boy, you're not possibilities. Looking, not that, uh, you're not in touch with the uh, with the labor front. We have National Nurses United, the 200,000 uh, members. They are, I think, completely mobilized for this. They have days of a-, a day of action on December 10th. And I personally represent the United Front Against Austerity, USAA. Okay. All right, let's talk up. Let's let's uh, okay. go into a break. When we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about some other topics. And uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to the show. I'm joined with guest Webster Tarpley from Washington, D.C., and we're talking about the fiscal cliff. Webster's got a lot to say. Go on, Webster. Take it. Uh, the, the basic solution to this uh, fiscal shortfall, right, you want to have, have a slightly smaller federal budget deficit, I think that's probably fine. We want to have plenty of money in the federal budget because we've got to pay Unemployment benefits for 99 weeks plus. We've got to have uh, food stamps at a much better level for everybody who needs it right now. The average food stamps um, payment is about a dollar and a half per person per meal. Most people get about thirty dollars a week, and uh, that is a ticket to uh, vitamin deficiency diseases that a lot of people have forgotten even exist. So. Um, there will be a lot of pressure on the federal budget to maintain the social safety net. Uh, indeed, the, the social security pension needs to be increased. Uh, the interesting thing is Obama has gone into these, these uh, negotiations intending to rip off his own base, to betray them, to stab them in the back. Uh, all of this was laid out by Obama in his interview with the Washington Post editorial board uh, in the week before his inauguration in 2009. And I have it written up in uh, Surviving the Cataclysm, the second edition from 2009. You can find it all in there. Uh, he basically said the purpose of his presidency was to take down Social Security and, and Medicare, uh, but to do it uh, gradually and to impose that kind of austerity. So that, that's what he's been about the whole time. The irony last week was that uh, Obama was pushing something called the Chained CPI, the Chained Consumer Price Index, which is a way to loot Social Security over time, uh, over decades. Uh, it's a way to make it wither on the vine. It's a way to make Social Security die 
the death of a thousand cuts. That's what Obama was doing. And he was using this uh, mechanism. Right? This would be something that Boehner had demanded, saying we've, we've got to have a way to uh, cut and gouge and chisel the cost of living escalator that's built into Social Security. You remember that Obama had promised that he would not cut Social Security. That was one of the bases of his campaign. But, of course, that's now forgotten. And so we, what we saw was a, a, a kind of a coming together of the Wall Street Democrat Obama and the reactionary uh, uh, Republican Boehner. But, of course, the thing that had then occurred was there were the 40 to 50 fascist Republicans who said, no, we won't vote for that because this is not fascist enough. This does not kill enough Americans. It doesn't have enough deadly uh, cuts and deadly austerity in it. So that's the irony that Obama has been prevented from selling out his base in a very dramatic way, precisely by these, these ogres, right, this Tea Party uh, caucus there in the, in the Republican uh, ranks. Now, the other thing that they pulled out, and we just want to mention this, uh, we now hear from Geithner that the, the so-called debt ceiling is going to be reached uh, next Monday on New Year's Eve. So um, this is another method of blackmail and extortion used by these Republicans. Uh, truly, those Republicans, that Tea Party caucus, those people are right-wing anarchists. They are people who hate government. They want to go back to the state of nature. They are wreckers and saboteurs inside any government that they're uh, elected to. They represent, you know, a benighted and backward part of this population. But the thing, uh, Obama had tried to get the, uh, the Republicans to grant him the power to raise the debt ceiling, which, of course, they, they refused to do. But here's the, the bottom line on this is the following. All of these reactionaries talk about the Constitution, the Constitution. Well, how about the, the Constitution, the 14th Amendment? And what it says in the 14th Amendment, and this is after the Civil War, it's designed to defend the integrity of the public debt of the United States. And it says... The public debt of the United States will not be questioned, and that means you've got to pay it. Once you've spent the money, once you've incurred the cost, once you've issued the bond, you have got to pay. And what, it, what that obviously means is that the concept of a debt ceiling is unconstitutional. It is a monstrosity from a 14th Amendment point of view. And it, 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 one, of the, one of the things this shows us is why these Tea Party reactionaries hate the 14th Amendment uh, so much. There's a lot of stuff in there that they hate because it prevents states from doing horrendous things and, and it, you know, it gives uh, you know, black people and others the right to, to, uh, to, uh, to be citizens and so forth. But anyway, the, the, the point is that Obama should come out and say, if we had a real president, somebody on the caliber of Roosevelt or Kennedy, they would come out and say, well, I invite you to negotiate in good faith, but I'm telling the world one thing. The United States will not default. I will order the Secretary of the Treasury to raise money. We can continue our normal operations unless and until you people decide to, uh, decide to respect the Constitution. And that is something that is within Obama's reach at any point. You cannot have a gang of reactionary thugs who are blackmailing the United States government. And you want to know the level of these people. One of those Tea Party groups is called Freedom Works. And the, the top honcho, well, there were two. There was this, this guy, Dick Army. Dick Army, remember him? He was Newt Gingrich's yeah. right-hand man in the Republican yeah. Revolution. And then you've got this other guy. You've seen him on television. He looks like... The man, by, by the way, Dick Army is the man with the most ironic name in Washington, by the way. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, <laughs> he, 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 there's this other guy uh, who's, I'm forgetting his name, he's a non-entity, but he's, he's a right-wing raving ideologue. And he's got these big sideburns, right? He's got these whiskers. They call them mutton chops, uh, this character. So yeah. we had a coup d'etat inside Freedom Works back in September, which has come out in the Washington papers now in the last couple of days, where Dick Army goes into the headquarters of Freedom Works with an armed goon. He's got an off-duty Capitol Hill policeman packing heat. And he comes in and confronts the guy with the mutton shop, saying, 
you're going to get out of here. I want you and you out of the building. And I got my armed guard here, my guy with the with the gun, ready to to take you out. Now, if if one of these characters had decided to live the philosophy that they talk about, right? This seems to be their fetish. Then the other guy could have pulled out his revolver, and we could have had an immediate, uh, or you know, assault rifle. What do I say? So we could have had gunplay. We could have had a massacre inside the offices of of Freedom Works. This is the level of the people who are blackmailing and extorting the United States government. This is out of the out of this world. Uh, well, and, Dick, and Dick Army is, was is, didn't Dick Army uh, wasn't his exit from Congress not so graceful? Wasn't he accused of uh, wrongdoing or convicted of wrongdoing? No, I don't think he ever was. I think he, uh, I, I can't recall how he left, but he was part. Of, he was part of the Gingrich clique, and uh, well, of course, yeah. what he found was that he could make much more money. Now, the way in which this thing has ended is that a reactionary billionaire, right? At, um, a character who, it, it, it's the guy who owns the cancer treatment centers of America, uh, has provided the money, the, you know, millions and millions over many years, so that the mutton shop character can maintain himself as the head of Freedom Work. So it's like every, you know, everybody who counts has got one of these of their own, right? The Koch brothers have Americans for Prosperity. Now the, the uh, cancer treatment centers of America guy has got Freedom Works, and then there's Tea Party Express, and it's all a market of dupes, because what it is is that the, the grassroots people, the little people, the ideologues, the true believers, they are cannon fodder, and the billionaires run these things and use these poor little jerks as, as foot soldiers uh, in their own, what so turn out to be palace intrigues, right, because they, they want to get, you know, their candidates. Can you imagine... That on the board of Freedom Works, we had C. Boyden Gray. Remember him, Boy Gray. He was yes, I do. The super patrician, super blue blood, the Ichabod Crane of the Bush, the elder White House. He was the White House uh, counsel, the lawyer, in-house White House lawyer for Mad Dog Bush, the elder. So that guy is on the board of a Tea Party group. This is absolute insanity, right? This is, these are not. Uh, not uh, grassroots organizations. This is pure astroturf. This is pure top-down. But anyway, those, I think, are the answers. And if you want to have a couple of other answers, you want to know what to do about Social Security, it's easy. Remove the cap. Yeah, right now, uh, wage income is only taxed up to about one hundred and five dollars or $110,000 per person. Just remove that cap. Any wage income up to sky's the limit, right, with no limit, uh, we'll be taxed at the at the rate of the uh, of the FICA tax, right? The the the, the uh, payroll tax that funds Social Security. And if you're worried about Medicare, you want to save some money for Medicare. Let Medicare Part D, which is the Medicare prescription drug benefit, let that thing haggle with Big Pharma, right? The Veterans Administration can haggle with with Big Pharma. They get you know 25, 30, 40 percent discount on the masses of, uh, of medications that they buy. Let Medicare Part D do that. They're even bigger. They're huge. And then, uh, then you can cut a tremendous part of those costs. But what you cannot do is start killing people in the name of cost reduction, which is obviously what Obama does, right? There is a death panel in there. There certainly is. Uh, but that, under the Nuremberg precedent, uh, that is a high crime against humanity, and there may be some a day of reckoning for that. Okay, well, we're going to go into a break. When we come back, we'd like to talk to Webster Tarpley about some of the, uh, the bigger global issues, uh, in particular what I've named a soft insurgency. I coined that in terms of... Okay, welcome back to the show. Um, Webster Tarpley's got a is a prolific author, and he's got a lot of books out there. And I urge listeners to go to his website, which is uh, not www. Leave the www's off. Just tarpley.net. T-A-R-P-L-E-Y.net. 
no www's or you can just search it in google just search tarpley and his is the first uh, queue you want to go to his site there's a lot of good stuff we also link to his site from my site which is www.voxnews.com so either one will get you to tarpley uh website i'd like to talk about this idea of this soft insurgency this this new way this somewhat less bloody way somewhat less mass casualty way more done with media and uh, death squads here and there and uh, one of the things i noticed when i saw the uh, when i was watching the egyptian uh, so-called revolution which was not a revolution at, at all it was a staged event and one of the things I noticed was that during the rallies, the massive rallies in Tahrir Square, there was moments when the people in the square were actually watching large screen projections of themselves on CNN engaging in their own revolution live uh, on tele- on international television, and then as soon as they, as soon as the ruling class here in America got rid of Hosni Mubarak, suddenly the screens, and you know, God knows who put those screens up there because they don't just pop up there by themselves. They somebody had to have staged all that. As soon as they got rid of uh, Mubarak and replaced it with another brutal dictator more to their liking, suddenly they cut to Charlie Sheen, who was having a breakdown. He had just kicked a hole in another hotel room and he got caught with some cocaine or something. And then the people in Tahrir Square were watching now Charlie Sheen on their screens. And revolution was literally at that point over. And it was then I realized that these these new forms of revolution are actually driven by uh, the centerpiece, which is a media event, uh, a staged media event. Uh, and, th- and, and it's this thing which is the inciting moment, it's the kickoff moment, it's the thing that gets the go code, and it's the thing that's it's, it's staged around. What do you think about that? Well, I think you have to look at the whole concept of the color revolution, the... Um uh, Albert Einstein Institute of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Gene Sharp, and uh, Colonel Robert, uh, what's his name, Colonel Robert McKelvey, I guess it is. Um, they uh, tell you uh, the rules for creating a, 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 the simulacrum of a destabilization. In other words, they yes, 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 similar. Uh, fake destabilization. But here's, if you look at Tunisia, what happened in Tunisia? This was a palace coup with a bunch of dupes that were out in the public square demonstrating. What really happened was that the U.S., the CIA, the Pentagon had subverted the generals of Tunisia so that you could, you, you know, you can, it's easy to get street demonstrations, you can get riots in poor countries, especially in the Depression, right, when the bread price is going up and Unemployment is high. You can get you can get riots, you can get street demonstrations, but that's not enough to contend for power. And the way that it worked with with uh, Ben Ali of Tunisia was he turned to the generals and he said, "Look, I've got these uh, hooligans here in the square. Uh, you want to help me get rid of them?" And they said, "No, you are out." So it's a, it's a palace coup masked and camouflaged by the presence of these uh, petty bourgeois student agitators. Uh, a lot of them who actually believe that they're they're doing it, but of course. Oh yes, they have no they have no idea. They're just set up. Oh, we we and actually have a call have a from Seattle. The, the, okay. The the, uh, the the question of the uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, there's oh, obviously yeah. an alliance between the CIA and the United States and the Muslim Brotherhood, and you have to know who those people are. That's Saudi Arabia pays pays for it. Those are stockbrokers. Uh, they're the rich. They're the the one or two percent of the society with people around them that they recruit to their their uh, operations of, uh, you know, social welfare and so forth. And that is what has taken over Egypt. I just want well, to stress... Stra- strangely, strangely enough, the uh, many of the objectives of the... Uh, of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood dovetail quite nicely with the objectives of, of our ruling class. That's one well, key... Let's, let's, take, let's indicate- get a very, very concrete, like Morsi. So here we have Morsi in Egypt. And what has he just done? Most people don't realize that the, I think one of the root causes of the, the, um, the tumult in Egypt of the last six weeks, eight weeks, has been a sellout by Morsi to the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund said, oh, we'll give you a $5 billion loan, but you've got to begin demolishing the price subsidies 
which are absolutely essential for these economies. They all go back to NASA. And you had them in, had them in Libya, had them in Syria today. You had them in Egypt, but they're under attack. Uh, these are price subsidies for fuel, for basic food stuff, cooking oil, heating oil, things like this. You have them in, in Iran, although they're being, they're being phased out in favor of, uh, of cash payments. So you don't have world market prices for a lot of things that people need, and that's good because the world market is, is, is corrupt. So what uh, Morsi just approved was a deal where the price of gasoline doubled uh, during the month of November. Now, any place in the world that you double the price of gasoline, you're going to have problems. Then there was an increase in the sales tax demanded by the IMF on its way to becoming a value-added tax. Now, this is bad policy. This is regressive taxation. This is a kind of a tax that cuts into the necessities of the poor and maybe the amenities of the middle class, but certainly does not touch the, the uh, sybaritic luxury of the, of, the, of the ruling elite. So I want to point to people, the good news from Egypt is the emergence of an opposition. There's a, there's a guy there named Hamdin uh, Salahi, okay? And this, this guy is um, Sabahi, sorry. Sabahi says no to the dictatorship of the army. He fought Mubarak. He was, he was in jail under Mubarak. And he says no to the dictatorship of the theocrats and the, the uh, oligarchs of the Muslim Brotherhood, who are simply rich people who dress themselves in the cloak uh, of religion. And the big thing with, with Hamdin Sabahi is to say no to the IMF, we will not accept IMF conditionalities. We don't want the loan. We want to have uh, economic protectionism. We want to have policies for uh, raising the lower incomes in the society. And the big, the big polemic between Sabahi and, uh, and Morsi is Morsi says, we want the market to rule. And Sabahi says, no, we do not want the market to rule. Because the market is the, the control by rich plutocrats. And if there are, you know, uh, people, uh, uh, fugitives from the Ron Paul movement listening in, look at, look at that. Right here you have a clear distinction. The side of evil is the side that goes with, uh, I want the market. And somebody who wants of to defend the population, and he has some concept of Egypt as a great nation, says no. We don't want the market in that sense. We don't want the unbridled free market. So Sabahi, of course, represents the master tradition. And I am, I'm very, very pleased to see that the thinking of, of Colonel Nasser of Egypt uh, from the 50s and 60s and 70s is not dead, but there is a third force. Right? And this, is, this is the guy who came in third in the presidential election, and he has been... Uh, a key part of the opposition against this, well, the Constitution, well, which is not a good Constitution. Well, one, one of one of the one of the points is that none of these none of, none of this was intended. It, the original intention is to throw these. The original intention is not to uh, have uh, free democratic uh, countries over there. That's not what they want. Obviously, if there was free countries over there, they would they would not to support any of these things. So, uh, the point is to take these secular nations and throw them into maybe Islamic fundamentalism, which will require quite a lot of military maintenance over the over the decades to to, and to it's, dig it's it for a weaker country the point is yeah. that if you if you have egypt with 10 percent or 15 percent cops christians yeah. uh and Balkanization. You this this constitution it's a recipe for endless trouble and of course in syria yeah. it's much worse because there you have uh it's about 15 to 20 percent are uh, Christians, they're Maronite Christians, Melkite well, Christians, Greek Orthodox. <laughs> well, Jews, they better they better Kurds, be pack, they better Alawite. be reserving their U hauls because uh, after uh, they get rid of Assad, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be a Christian in Syria. I'd like to go to a caller. We have a Maria in Seattle calling. Uh, Maria, you're on the air. Hello, Maria, are you out there? Okay. Uh, it's about 15. I lost you, uh, Webster. I can't hear. I'm sorry. Okay, I, j I just lost you for a second. We had Maria in Seattle. Maria, are you there? Because uh, after 
uh, they get rid of Assad. I wouldn't want to be a Christian in Syria. I'd like to go to a call. We have a Maria in Seattle calling. Uh, okay, she's Maria. You have to listen on your phone, not on your radio. Yeah. There's, this, there's a delay. Yeah. Turn off your radio now, please, and just listen through your phone. Okay, got it. Okay, go ahead. Ask Webster or myself any question you'd like. Hello. Um, good evening. This is Maria from Seattle. I'm a journalist. Um, first, would like to salute Webster Tarpley. Thank you very much for years of beautiful work following you. Um, you're my hero. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, what's your question for myself or Webster tonight? Um, or your comment, whatever it is. Question or comment, whatever. Sure. Um, I would like to compare what's going on right now uh, with the fiscal cliff to a Russian situation maybe at some point while the President Yeltsin was um, in power. And uh, him and oligarchs, oligarchs could have saved uh, infrastructure um, from failure, but they didn't do it. And that's exactly what I observed today is happening here uh, when riches wouldn't like to pay their fair share. And basically, the sabotage is the word that comes to mind. Uh, when you observe uh, the news today. So, okay, we're, we're going. Okay, go ahead. C continue a little bit. We got a few more seconds. Thirty more seconds. Go ahead. All right. Sure. Um, and after ten years of so-called uh, war on terrorism, you know, um, well, it's time to be patriotic now. Republicans are totally backing off and chickening out, and basically they don't care if their beloved country is going down. Uh, they're indifferent. They're selfish. And this is a total mm -hmm. sabotage. Um, what do you think about that? Okay, we'll, we'll pick that up at the, at the. We'll pick that up at the at the at the end of the break when the break comes back. Okay, thank you. We, you're at INN New World Report with Webster Tarpley, and I am your host Vox tonight, standing in for Tom Kylie. Back to back to the air with Webster Tarpley. We're going to start off with a little bit of these uh, fake people power revolutions, uh, where they do a couple things. They finance troublemakers. They bribe target officials in target countries for a high-level defection. They stage rape, fake rape incidents. They arrange a giant photo opportunity. They send in Al-Qaeda, send in the death squads, create a no-fly zone and the dreaded humanitarian aid. And, uh, of course, always with the grainy, blurry cell phone, unverified action video. Webster, what's going on and why are we falling for this uh, obvious fakery all the time? Well, my, when I'm, I'm writing an article now uh, this week, and you can see it on properly.net in, um, you know, in a day or two. Uh, the, the model for what's being done to Syria... This is really not a color revolution. Now, this is uh, this was death squads from the very beginning. This is actually out of the history of Central America. Right? We had the way it worked was John Negro Ponte had perfected the death squad technique in Central America in the seventies uh, and eighties, and then he moved on to become the U.S. Uh, proconsul there in Iraq. Uh, in the audience, right in the past decade, John, John and, Death Squad Negroponte, that one. That, that's the one, and uh, his protege was Ambassador Ford, who today is the is the U.S. Uh, State Department point man for running the Syrian opposition. So this these Death Squads from the very beginning. Same thing in Libya. The first demonstrations in Libya were not political demonstrations going to the public square to demand freedom and democracy. Because they, they had been demonstrations under Gaddafi all along. Right? It's not like you couldn't demonstrate. You could. But uh, in this case, they were marches on military bases to take them by surprise and start uh, getting a hold of weapons stocks. And in Syria, it was a massacre from the beginning. In other words, if there were some pro-democracy dupes out there, you know, imagining that, that they could... Um, you know, have a peaceful demonstration. They couldn't, and it was because immediately among their own ranks there appeared these these death squad characters. And these people have now been shown. They come from Chechnya in southern Russia. It's been estimated that about a thousand Pakistani Taliban have been killed fighting against the Assad uh, government and the Syrian army. Uh, they come from Somalia. In other words, there's a there's a you know several thousand mile swath of the earth 
where everybody who is an unemployed fanatic is being recruited, and they've just they've just brought in another echelon, right? Another well, I, <laughs> well the thing I like, the thing I love is that they show the the, the, the amazing success that they have in fooling us is that they call these people protesters yet we see video footage of them with like turret mounted like 50 caliber like high artillery weapons mounted on the back of hummers these are not um these are not protesters these are these are combat combat combatants and yeah, uh the, and those, the, so it's, those things that it's you're, you're talking about the toyota toyota pickup trucks with the heavy machine guns on the back those were brought from libya those, of course. There was an airlift, an airlift of death squad representatives, uh, fighters, and their, their, their typical uh, hardware was brought by uh, ocean lift across the Mediterranean, airlift to the city of Iskanderun, Turkey, and the uh, Incherlik NATO Air Force Base, Adana, Turkey, uh, and, and, and so forth. So uh, this is well, a... It's a military operation. It's a CIA secret army, which has been assembled in southern Turkey, in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in the Kurdish uh, part of, of, of northern Iraq, and then sent in for murder and mayhem. And the goal, of course, is, is chaos. The model of this is what Hitler did to Czechoslovakia in uh, 1938. But I just wanted to, to, to not, not forget completely Maria's... Um, Question, right? About she was talking about uh, Yeltsin and the oligarchs, right? And the obvious comparisons of that regime to what we have here in the United States. Um, the, the, the beginning of wisdom in political analysis is that famous Book Seven of Plato's Republic, where we hear about tyranny, of course, we hear about uh, mob rule or ochlocracy. Uh, which is also bad. And above all, we hear about uh, oligarchy, right? The Constitution full of many evils where the rich rule and the poor have absolutely no voice. And if you look at the array of uh, human societies over you know, five or 10,000 years, what you will find is that most of them are oligarchies. Uh, even the ones that look like they're uh, tyrannies are, are often not. They're more oligarchical than tyrannical when you begin to, to delve inside. You could say in the case of um, the Soviet Union, right, considered a, a tyrannical dictatorship. No, it's an oligarchy, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, an oligarchy of the, of the party. There, you can see Lenin uh, in his um, left-wing communism uh, uh, right after World War I writes that the Bolshevik government is an oligarchy. And it is, because it's got this, this Politburo. The times when one person could give orders without any pushback are just a very few years under Lenin, maybe during the Civil War, but probably not even then. Under Stalin, uh, primarily, you know, in, the, in the, the 30s and 40s. But the vast majority of the history of the Soviet Union, it's an oligarchy. Even Hitler would be, con maybe Hitler considered more um, more absolute and extreme. But in his case, he had to worry about army officers of the kind who eventually tried to kill him, but also the Gauleiters, right? The, the province chiefs, you can call them, the Gauleiters of, uh, of Germany. But the, the rule then is, and this you can trace back, you know, you can find this in uh, all, you know, you can get it back to Herodotus and Thucydides, that Oligarchy is the enemy of the modern nation state, and what you see in the case of, of the of the Russian oligarchs with the, with Yeltsin, but also of the one percent today, right, the Koch brothers and people like this, is that their oligarchical privileges mean infinitely more to them than any consideration of a nation or patriotism or these other values that are more. Um, more common in the in the you know the the less privileged parts of the of the population, and and what you see is the the, the problem with the the, the English speaking world is that the English speaking world will tell you your choices between tyranny and democracy. Well, but those are not the choices. There's that 
other area, which turns out to be, you know, most of the world, most of the time, over many, many centuries, is that oligarchy sits there in the middle, right? It can be an oligarchy of generals, of priests, of bureaucrats, um, of, you know, all, all different kinds. But that is, that is the one which is incompatible with the modern state. And what we see, the, the strategy for the oligarchy in, in terms of their own survival, the Anglo-American ones in particular, is that they want the breakup of the modern state. They find that the breakup of the modern state, which is a, an institution that's been around but, but you know, six or seven hundred years at the very most, uh, they want that gone. So they say, Scotland will secede. Um, Belgium will break up into two parts. Sudan has been busted up. Iraq is divided into three. Turkey will be carved. Uh, Pakistan, there will be four or five. Uh, Iran, there will be five or six. Uh, and on and on and on. Right? And this is this, this idiocy of secessionism that we've, uh, that we've seen. And secessionism, as in the case of the Soviet Union, is the way that the oligarchy tries to maintain itself when, the, when nation states come under, uh, under stress, right? I think well, this is Brzezinski's, this is Brzezinski's point is the dissolution of the idea in people's heads of the nation state. People are more concerned with their personal hobbies than with any idea of allegiance to their own state. <laughs> yes, right, right. That you want dignity. He says you want dignity, and dignity uh, means, uh, it, well, if, if you're a left-handed Presbyterian pinochle player, then you've got to have a policy, a, a, a state, a, a nation, which is made up similarly of left-handed Presbyterian pinochle players. It, it, it's absurd. Sure. And the other thing that what get, gets lost in that is it, it becomes a human zoo, because where's, where's the uh, general welfare? Where, where's the notion of economic progress without which nothing else works, right? Uh, anyway, what we just had in the election, I think, is a, is a defeat for the uh, the war party, right? In other words, the out and out bombing and aggression party with uh, with Romney and Ryan and Petraeus uh, clearly in the background and helping them along, and that clique of generals, like General Ham, Admiral Stavridis, uh, Admiral Gallet, uh, the Gallup poll got involved because they were. Sort of greasing the skids for for vote fraud by telling people that that Romney was ahead, uh, the head of Lockheed, right, the biggest defense contractor in the world by most measures, was also involved and and, and so forth. But this and and Karl Rove, right, Karl Rove with his Orca system, which was supposed to deliver the majority uh, to Romney, but somehow that that uh, that failed. So. We've well, this, this this election proved that their their typical systems of vote rigging did not uh, succeed because the ruling class wanted Romney to win, and they didn't get what they wanted. So that means that there is some uh, weakness on their part in their normal ways, their electronic means. Yeah, maybe it might be more accurate to say that the ruling class was not unanimous. In other words, that the that the it is remember the Anglo American system. It is based on the Venetian one, and it is based on the on the uh, the British Whigs, the English Whigs of the 1600s and 1700s. And uh, in in their case, uh, it's a polycentric system. It it, it it does yes. not want a single dictatorial center. It's organized to try to prevent that, uh, but that also means that it's uh, it's divided, right? And so you have different. It, it, you know, it, it's a, it's a largely a fake division, but you can distinguish a Soros wing from a Koch Brothers, Melonscape, Cancer Treatment Centers of America wing. So you don't think like that, that they want a one-world government? I don't know what you mean by that. What they want well, is... is there's this idea of the consolidation of power. The idea is that every single organization of humankind can and has been proven to be usurped, so that if they can get it all under one umbrella, then they just usurp no, that, and they own the whole show. This, I think this is a mistake. If, if, if you, like, cause remember, this is a very bad slogan, right? Where did that one world government slogan come from? This is Cleon Skousen. This is a Mormon. This is a right-wing reactionary Mormon, um, you know, who was um, attempting to muddy the waters as best he could back in the well, didn't David Rockefeller say it at the at the commencement of the Bilderberg yeah, meeting? Uh, 
let's not, it, it, this, this, is a, this is a primitive form of analysis. Here's what we see. They want to smash the nation state, that's for sure. And they want to go to rump, rump state, warlords, uh, you know, uh, micro state, mini state, and, and what have you. Okay, and, we go into the, uh, we're going to a break now. I am up in NATO. I, 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 okay, just a well, few more minutes now. I got to run. Okay, we'll, we'll be back with Rep. <laughs> Tarpley right after the break. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the show. We're talking to Webster Tarpley. His website is www.tarpley. I'm mean, sorry, no www, just tarpley.net. There's a lot of books, a lot of information, and a lot of television appearances that he appears on every week, and you're going to want to check that out. It's very, very good information. Go ahead, Webster. Finish your last thought. Anyway, I, I have to conclude now, but just the, the idea is this. I would put aside these slogans. New World Order is a bad slogan. One world government, bad slogan. Here's what you have. The tendency is to smash every nation state. It means if you think you're a secessionist, then you're working for the, for the side of evil. You're working for the powers of evil. Uh, Why? I want, to, I, want, I want New York to secede from the United States. What's wrong with that? Lots of luck. Uh, I don't have time. You know, I, I, I realize you want to try to... You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, yeah, the, I, the, the urge to secede is a genuine urge. The French wanted to do, the French Quebecois wanted to do that, and they had a good reason to, because culturally they, they, they were but that's the more advanced. They did not. They did not. And the vote was against it. And it would be against <laughs> it again. And secessionism in the United States is extremely artificial. Uh, it takes a network of southern jurisdictions, Scottish Rite Freemasons, and British agents, and other uh, vermin in my book to to get uh, secessionism in 1860 and 1861. It is not popular. It has to be rammed through. Uh, it leads to countervailing movements like West Virginia is one example. The, the upcountry of many states, Tennessee, so forth, they don't want any part of this. Uh, so there's a lot of mythology around this. But the, the goal of the of the financier community, Wall Street, London, and the think tanks that they support, is to smash the nation state, divide that into micro states, mini states, rump states, failed states, warlords. Chaos. I would love that. That sounds yeah. like perfect okay. situation. The, the, no, if, if you want to live to be thirty five in cannibalism and infanticide, and then above <laughs> that, above that, you have the International Monetary Fund and NATO. And if you want to call that a government, I suppose that's the idea. But notice, this is not anything good. Uh, there's no place in this for, for Russia or China. In other words, it's not like these other powers are equal partners. They are not. This is nothing new. This is the U.S.-British world empire. It's been around since World War II. It is attempting to, uh, re- you know, to revamp itself, to morph in order to survive under conditions of economic depression and imperialist breakdown crisis, which is what we're, we're in right now. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, one of the harbingers of this is Ron Paul himself. Famous speech, you should look at it, he's got it on his congressional website. Take now the last days of his time in Congress. If you want to see what Ron Paul was all about, go to this speech about... Um, it's about March or April of 2001. It's about six months before the 9-11 terrorist uh, attacks. And he says, we have nothing to fear from globalism, universal free trade, and a commodity currency, by which he means gold. So he wants globalization, globalism, he says this, globalism, free trade, Universal, no tariffs, no no regulations, no nothing, and a gold currency. So the gold currency is independent of any government, and the free trade diminishes the powers of government. Now that's that's his way of getting to uh, what you'd call a universal empire or universal monarchy. Uh, but of course, this world that he's describing could not support six to seven billion. People. This would be a world for maybe one or two billion. So that would be a genocide of 
four to five billion. And and if you look at his economic program, that's pretty much what he uh, what he wants in his economic program. Uh, just one last example: uh, if you look at Ron Paul's uh, um, program, Restore America, the thing that he ran on, where he finally got specific in in, in uh, contrast to these throwaway lines, he took the the um, this, among other things, the food stamp program, he wanted to cut that by 62 to 63 percent. So instead of having one dollar and a half per person per meal, you would go to about 50 cents per person per meal. And that's a recipe for death on a large scale. So uh, that, is the, that is the motivating force of, of this stuff. So I am proud to take my stand on the modern nation state. Absolutely. Uh, Obviously, you know, reform agenda, modernization, and so forth. But you look at Syria, the transition to uh, microstates and mini-states, that's what you see in Syria. There is nothing worse. No outcome is worse than civil war. Civil war is the But that's, that's not a real worse. civil war, though. That's a, that's, that's a media-fueled, uh, intelligence agency-fueled uh, conflict. It it's not because a... Because there are, there are enough indigenous... Forces. I mean, they've been they've been uh, dragged in. Right? I, I already yes, went Web, through Webster. Most of the, if if most there was a superpower, to, I just went yes. through that. But if there was a superpower to the north of America that suddenly was funneling uh, surface-to-air missiles to thousands of Americans, you'd have Americans firing them upon their government, too. So this idea that just because there are some people in these nations that are getting weapons and firing them against their government, people would do that here. I would say almost is as many, uh, if not more. Well, I I, I can't uh, speculate on that, but let me just remind people: you can find me at Tarpley dot net, and uh, Twitter feed is Webster G Tarpley. We will be having protest actions as the situation evolves. Uh, if if uh, if there's there's going to be an attempt made between Sunday night and Monday to have a last sell out uh, stab in the back grand bargain package. I don't think this is likely to succeed, but it might. And that would be Obama's last chance to impose killer cuts on Social Security specifically. That's what he would be giving Boehner. He'd say to Boehner, uh, I want you to agree with me now that we're going to have some small tax increase on the super rich, but in exchange for that, we're going to gouge the Social Security pension until it withers on the vine. Uh, if that happens, we've got to get out in the streets and show uh, the, the public and the world, indeed, that somebody's fighting. So watch the Webster G. Tarpley uh, Twitter feed, and I urge you to follow it. Subscribe to it. It's easy, right? You just follow it, and then you get this stuff automatically, and you can keep up with the United Front Against Austerity. Okay? Well, okay, thank you very much your for, for your time. Thank you very much, Webster. It's a it's okay. a, a privilege to have you on your show. Thank you so okay. much. See you soon. Good luck. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye.